Hi, I'm Katie Kempner, and we're here at the WebMD interview stage at Advertising Week. And this is Perspective, which is a series of inspiring conversations with remarkable working women who are balancing busy and successful lives. And right now, I'm talking with Jessica Navis, who is the Chief Planning Officer of Irwin Penland. Yay. Welcome. Thanks, Katie. So, why don't we start, in case anyone doesn't know about Irwin yeah. Penland, talk Absolutely. a little bit about that and, and how you got there. Because you were at some bigger, more, bigger agencies before yeah, that, too, right? Yeah. Um, so, I actually, I, I have to say, I work in planning. I love my career. Uh, I studied psychology and French in school. I never knew what that application could be. And I actually started working um, fairly out of school for Shia Day, where I got to know Jane Newman. Jane Newman took me to uh, Merkley Newman Hardy when she had just founded it. I was her baby planner. Uh, worked there for about seven years. After that, worked at Cliff Freeman and Partners for about mm -hmm. six years. And then worked at JWT for about six or seven. So I'm a little bit of an anomaly in advertising, and I'm, I'm a bit of a lifer in each phase. Um, each one of those, I, I learned so much, obviously, from Jane. Jane's incredible. She's an incredible leader. She's a force. Uh, it was interesting to learn kind of the rigors of strategic pursuit from her, then able to apply it to a fantastic, amazing, kind of world-changing creative at Cliff Freeman and Partners, work with obviously incredible, incredible creative talent. And then JWT, where I worked with Rose and Ty, Rosemary Ryan and Ty Montague, who are just incredible, incredible leaders, worked on the most dynamic brands, did great work for, Je uh, for JetBlue, um, pitched in one Puma, uh, worked on Rolex a little, worked on so many great accounts. It was interesting, though, at that point in my life, um, I was feeling a little bit like, you know, I'd stayed at each place for a while. Mm -hmm. I, I felt a little bit of kind of the entrepreneurial buzz, and actually a former creative um, lead at JWT, Con Williamson, was uh, luring me over to a small agency called Irwin Penland, and they're based out of Greenville in New York. Um, they're amazing because the story that I love about them is that, for example, for Denny's, you know, they began by designing menus. They're very, very inside out. They're now, you know, agency of record. They're doing amazing social things. Um, for all the accounts they've worked on, Verizon, you know, they're kind of a ninja agency that begins with smaller projects. But really, really, um, you know, we all talk about storytelling. That's mm -hmm. a huge thing in what we do. In planning, that's one of the things that I love is identifying what that story is mm -hmm. and the convergence of you know, the brand ethos and heritage and what that means for the consumer and the cultural moment. All of that is, is a fantastic and robust brand story, but it's meaningless unless you're telling it in a compelling way, yeah. um, in compelling places. And that's what Irwin Penland does so well, which I love, is that they're really about kind of building out that story and making it live and breathe. Um, so that was, I mean, that was actually my segue into that. And, and the fantastic thing being at all the wonderful agencies preceding you know, really taking stories and bringing them to life really quickly and nimbly and, and meaningfully. So the interesting thing to me then is you took a different career trajectory yeah. going sort of maybe backwards to how some people do, um, going from, you know, bigger to... What, <laughs> I think that a lot of people are afraid to sort of follow their path that yeah. way yeah. and feel like they should be following something a little more traditional or that they're told they should do. Yeah. I mean, it was interesting, and I, I love that you're saying that because certainly after, you know, probably having a bit more, uh, you know, one could view it as conservative, me staying at each place for six or seven years. You know, to know the industry is to know that every place can change radically right, right. every two or three years. So there was always new leadership and at each one of the places where I was working. However, you're right. I mean, it was a really interesting, considered process. I love JWT and I love Robin Bardolia and I love the leadership there and I love so many people. But I just felt like that for me personally, it was actually time to take a risk and to see how it played out. And... Um, you know, it's interesting because it's not even that much of a risk. You know, I love all the yeah. people at Irwin Penland. It was great because we were actually um, just named, you know, one of the top agencies that punches above its weight, which I think is such an amazing accolade. That's just Really? Yeah, it's such a scrapper accolade with some really, really great agencies like 180 and, and so many others. Um, I didn't know there was that award. I know, it's really, it's really, really cool. And that's what I kind of like about in an agency that's so much, or I'm sorry, in an industry that's so much about beating one's chest we're kind of doing things yeah. a little bit, I mean, certainly we're talking about it, but it's a little bit more under the radar, and we're doing, you know, great solid work. But yes, yeah, so it, it wasn't so much of a, what a, what courage, you know, how brave of you, because yeah. it's definitely a calculated risk, but, but there's something funny, because I, uh, 
I'm sorry to, I know, I know no, the you want to get a point out. <laughs> but I just heard this thing today um, on the radio because I'm an NPR addict, and it was just a little blur, but it was talking about how, you know, when men are doing a startup and if it fails, they're like, oh, well, that was a fluke, you know, I'll just do it again. Yeah. And how women sometimes, when they're involved in a startup and it doesn't fail, they're like, okay, well, the idea's wrong and just scrap that. And, you know, they're probably beating themselves up a little bit. So it's interesting because. You know, I thought long and hard about making this decision, but in a weird way, I kind of didn't either. I just thought, you know what, this is the next step for me, and it's also time for me to do something that seems a little bit um, less traditional and a little bit more unconventional. And I'm so happy that I did. And, and what I've learned from that, too, so many aspects of, yes, there's the work, but just mm -hmm. in terms of kind of leadership and style and a small agency and, and frankly, I, I love just the idea of, like, wearing a thousand hats again you know, again, love all my previous agencies, but really love the notion of kind of getting into the thick of it. Again. Yeah. So, I'm well, addicted to that Well, you said energy. like four things there that okay. I want to go back to. But one of the things that you said especially was how if it, what you heard today. So if men, if it doesn't work out for a man, he says, okay, Starts whatever. Crazy. And for a woman, yeah. you know, that. And I think women do that a lot, a lot more, right? Where yeah. they take things much more personally. I know. And you know, give up a lot sooner. Right. And, you know, it, it, it's a shame it that that happens. Bonkers. It drives me bonkers. And I feel like there are a lot of these tidbits rolling around right now. Just, there's that other one about, and this one I can't stand either, um, although I cite it all the time, but it's just <laughs> one of the most frustrating ones. Just that, you know, when looking at Monster, or what, what have you, if you feel, if women feel as if they're maybe only 50% qualified, you know, mm -hmm. or 60% qualified for a job, they're not going to do it. Whereas yeah. many men are kind of like, ah, okay, great, I yeah. can learn that. And I don't even want to get into a male-female thing, but these are just interesting threads, particularly as, you know, myself, I'm well into my 40s. Obviously, we know that... We figured out we're the same age, yeah, so yeah. being well into yeah, your 40s exactly. is not a bad thing. Not at all. <laughs> no. and, but I'm also, you know, again, what I do, I'm, I'm certainly obsessed with age cohorts and generations and you know, the entire world is, is focused on the millennials, and certainly we're looking at Gen Z and all of that. But it's still fascinating for me in light of those kind of points that we've heard on the radio. And it's interesting because even that research to me feels a little bit through a paradigm that's yeah. older because I just, you know, it's funny because I think about, you know, certainly I love being a mentor. And, you know, I've taken so many, you know, young planners, male, female, um, I'm like male, female, everyone um, under my wing, but it's really interesting because I learned so much from them as well. And I think that what's really, really cool is, first of all, the graduation of millennials a little mm -hmm. bit, like let's focus on another audience, and really it's just more about youth today. But also this idea that, you know, even when I talk to some of my young gals and guys too, um, and ask them about what they believe feminism is, and do they believe that they're a feminist, um, and I have so many, you know, young guys that work for me too that, that say that they're feminists, which is great, but they all bristle at the label. Um, so it's interesting uh, because when feminist. we start, yes. So what's interesting is that, you know, I feel like that I come from a time where I'm like, you know, who isn't a feminist? It's being a humanist and you just, you know, feminism is all just about equal rights and, you know, point being that even with our optimism and idealism of ourselves and the next few generations, we're still only making 70 cents to the dollar, 79 cents to the dollar. Yeah. So, you know, there's still, we have a long way to go even if we get on the $10 bill, but still, it's, you know, it's this wonderful sense of, um, you know, not wanting to be labeled, this sense of fluidity, this whole notion of, you know, I hate even saying this, you do you, because it sounds so flip, but it really is an um, kind of unforeseen time of individuality, acceptance, you know, not just tolerance, but yeah. huge acceptance and encouragement, encouragement to be yourself, which I think is, so fantastic, and you know, I think that we probably all love our quotes. Um, and one that I have just stuck with for the last year. Or so, do you, do you follow Humans of New York? No. Is, oh my Should God, I? One of my I yes. I've heard about it all week. So good, and yeah. yeah, and you know, he has a book, and he actually is going beyond New York now. But what he'll do is he just, you know, it's very much, it's incredible actually. It shows the need for more conversation. But he'll just ask these very pointed questions of strangers, and they will reveal so much because I think people are a little bit more hungry for connection now more than ever. Yeah. But you know, you you also it's a wonderful um, it's a wonderful dose of humanity, and it's just a way to see that you know what we are all the same, and we're all going through the same things. Anyway, he uh, saw Mal Malcolm Gladwell on the street mm -hmm. and just asked him the simple question of what would you tell a room full of 100 people, and he said you know kind of his mantra or words to live by change your mind about something significant every day. 
And I just thought that was hmm. so potent. Change your mind. Yeah. And, and just that idea of, particularly as we age, we become so set in stone, like, yeah. you know, I've been through this experience and, you know, oh, I know how that's going to turn out. And for me, and particularly when I focus on some of my, um, you know, my younger planners and obviously just, you know, the kids at the agency. It's just a great uh, exercise to kind of be like, huh, I hadn't thought about it that way. Yeah. And to continue to have an open mind throughout. I think that that's actually just critical. And I think that actually that's the thread that we're seeing. Certainly, I mean, I think that there's a danger in looking at millennials and Gen Z. I mean, a lot of what they're experiencing is youth. It was the same with us. I mean, we were all idealistic and rebellious and had a kind of anti-authority streak and all of that. But it's interesting how you feel that technology is really kind of enabling, fueling so much of this too and amplifying it. And changing things so, you know, changing things so rapidly. Oh my gosh. But I also think with millennials now and, and younger people, they feel, rightly so, this is a good thing, not as locked in to a certain path or a certain way, yeah. but they feel the, the right, really, yeah. to figure out themselves and their career and their lives right. in a way with a lot less conformity yeah. than, than we did. Right. And that's a good thing. And I think it's really interesting because something that, you know, we've talked about and certainly I think a lot of women talk about too is this notion of balance and whether it, it's that word and I know that word is a little bit loaded, um, but it, what's fascinating to me is when you see, um, you know, kind of all the research studies and you see and you speak to these young kids that are already kind of talking about, well, I want a balance and, and perhaps it's because they've experienced that watching their parents yeah so they're kind of echoing a little bit of what they've they've experienced themselves but you know for me the notion of balance I don't have children and I'm not married not obviously that I don't have relationships in my life that I'm balancing but I don't have the kind of traditional balance that everyone's talking right. about the traditional juggling but you know it's really for me and especially at this point in my life and career it's extracting purpose and meaning out of everything that I do so certainly I'm you know, I'm giving a lot of passion to what I do for work, and that's why I love what I do. And, and frankly, I wouldn't be able to give as much passion if I didn't love what I do, and I probably wouldn't be where I am if I didn't love that yeah. everything, that all the exploits and, you know, understanding psychology and understanding the consumer, and I love all of these things. Um, but it's, you know, trying to understand a little bit more about, uh, you know, each one of these generations and kind of, you know, what is... What does meaning mean for them? What does purpose mean for them? But I think also importantly, these are all great, but what about when the rubber hits the road? <laughs> you know, well, and you actually, it's great to have, have these ambitions. Have, yeah, but then, bills to pay, responsibilities. Right. Well, what happens when, you, you, move when, when you move out of your parents' house? When you move out of your parents' yeah. house. So that's and always interesting to watch. Exactly. I mean, you, you've raised a lot, a lot of really important points. And I think, it, you know, when I started doing this, I was doing it because I thought I'm so mixed up. I, I have this, <laughs> you know, big job and I have these so two kids. For you. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I, I thought, come into it was this, therapy right? <laughs> and I thought, let me just talk to everybody I know. Right. But I also thought, here are all these women that have seemed to be able to figure out a yeah. life for themselves. And I quickly realized that yes, motherhood was one very real and immediate factor. Yeah. But that there was a flip side of it where women that didn't have children to worry about were almost even had a harder time at balance and you know let's not yeah. call it balance if people don't like that but because you couldn't say you know right. oh I'm going because I have to right. do this so it was you have it even more upon yourself to say wait a second right. I'm gonna have to figure out a way where I have a personal life and a professional right. life and you know all of that together right and I think that you know what what's challenging with all of that and, and this is a question that we have to ask ourselves too is that you're exactly right, even being a mom, but we're still fitting into the boxes that has it been society? I mean, who, who's created this sense of, okay, well, because I'm a mom, I can say that I need to leave at 5.30. Yeah. Because we know that, you know, everybody knows that, you know, these are hard and fast rules. Um, you know, I think that, you know, we talked a little bit about my own taking a little bit of an unconventional path, which isn't even that unconventional. You know, I'm working at a smaller agency. So it's not that radical. Unconventional-ish. <laughs> I know, exactly. It's not like the courage, the bravery. Um, it's really not that unconventional. However, you know, it's, I think the interesting thing about maybe balance, the way that I like to think of it, is just bringing your own personal style to everything. Yeah. Because I think that, you know, the one thing about, you know, we talk about youthful idealism. Maybe now we're able to translate that idealism into practice a bit more, which is something that I've certainly um, 
worked on and towards. Uh, I, I'm pretty unapologetic about my own kind of boundaries and what I think is important for myself. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that you know I would hope I, I'm certainly that way with the people that are in my department. And you have to hire people and and nurture and work with people. Frankly, and, and this includes the team, the, leader, the leadership team, wh whom, frankly, a lot of them are men. Yes. But it's like we all have a very um, tremendous about, uh, amount of respect for each other and each other's lives. You know, I'm, you know, I love, I, I mean, frankly, I work with a lot of guys that are actually like working moms. They leave at a certain time. You know, they make sure that they have dinner with their children. And yeah. so I think that everybody, this actually is a little bit more universal than just women. Um, and I think that, you know, we all know that technology and gadgetry and all that has meant that our jobs could be 24 hours. Again, the nice thing is that we all like what we do so much that we are thinking about it all the time at certain points. I, I bristle a little bit from multitasking because I just don't think that, I think that we're actually learning that doing yeah. 10 things at once is really, you're not cheating thinking. everyone and, and everything and you're not focusing enough. But, but ultimately, I, I kind of feel like this, you know, hopefully with age, you, you do get not only the confidence in your ability and your voice to express when you need to say yes and no, but also in the content yeah. you're delivering. So it's just, so to me, I actually, and maybe it is different because maybe, it, maybe I don't have these traditional constituents, um, you know, in terms of having children. Uh, but, but for me, I just feel like it actually hasn't been that uh, that much of a struggle. Mm -hmm. I just feel like that you know it's I've carved out my space and and what I need and you know and again I'm kind of rolling the dice and if it doesn't work then it doesn't work but but I think that it will because it's all about again the passion that you yeah. put into each one of your projects. You know that being you know not just my work which is fantastic but you know, you know charity work that I do or donating my time or all of the other ways I'm trying to kind of extract meaning from the world. Well then you are the perfect person for me to ask this last yes. question to which is... Is it over so soon? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know okay. we're going to have to do a sequel. Okay, please. <laughs> which is what one piece of advice can you share with us that has helped guide you through your career and your life? <sighs> um, I mean it just has to be about trusting yourself. I mean I think I have not listen to my instincts and seeing the ramifications of that. The hard thing that, you know, it's, I feel like it's always a little trite to say that though because honestly you have to mess up to mm -hmm. learn from that. I mean, you, you have to fall off to get back up and rise a little bit higher. I feel like I'm speaking like postcards um, because I often think that, I think about all the uh, advice that's been bestowed upon me for mm -hmm. which I'm very, very grateful, but I have to learn it myself. Yeah. You know, and I love all of the women and men who have given me so many wonderful pearls of wisdom, but honestly, you have to experience it yourself, so I think it is kind of trusting your gut even when you're going to fall over. But honestly, the light at the end of the tunnel, even after, even when you get up, is so bright and great. It's rewarding. That's terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you.